Hello and welcome to this presentation on asynchronous programming in C Sharp 5, .NET 4.5. My name is Shiv Kumar and I'm going to be presenting to you the new async await um, capability in .NET C, uh, sorry, in C Sharp 5. And uh, this is a two-part presentation. In this part one of this presentation, we are going to be looking at what is asynchronous programming and what it is not and how the asynchronous programming relates to IS and ASP.NET, or specifically the ASP.NET pipeline. There'll be uh, a bunch of demos, and in these demos we'll be looking at primarily the, the ability to scale or have more responsive applications and the difference between parallel async and parallel async. Um, we'll be looking, while we're doing this presentation, we'll be looking at uh, certain concepts such as IO completion ports or overlapped IO and in part two we'll be looking at um, how to test the scalability or how to load test your applications and ensure that what you are writing is in in, uh, in fact scalable and the scenarios in which you should or should not be using asynchronous uh, programming. So for many years now, we've been, most of us have thought about asynchronous as something that is kind of being done in the background. And that is primarily because uh, from a UI perspective, you would spin off some process in on, on a background thread, leaving the UI thread to be free to process the, the regular uh, events or message pump. And so our mindset is more about doing things asynchronously to kind of free up the, the UI. And that's true, except uh, what we are looking at uh, now in C-Sharp 5 is not about threads or it's not about background work. It's actually about um, IO-bound asynchronous workloads. So when you're doing IO-bound workloads, you're not concerned so, many, so much or you're not concerned at all about threads or spawning threads or doing stuff in the background because IO-bound workloads do not use the CPU. And in the next couple of slides, we'll be looking at uh, more details about that statement as to what does IO bound workload actually mean and how is it disconnected from the CPU itself. So just keep that in mind the, that IO bound workloads are not CPU bound, therefore they don't require the CPU. And these two workloads are actually uh, quite different. So when it comes to IO, you could be doing IO asynchronously, yet there are no threads involved. While any CPU bound work, um, if any of you have been done in, have been doing any statistical analysis in the past using uh, let's say an MCMC model or you know any Bayesian uh, computation, you'd know that uh, these are very CPU intensive workloads as in they use the CPU quite a bit and um, IO bound workloads are very different. IO bound workloads are workloads like uh, reading a file from the from the file system making a network call to a service somewhere, either you know using SOAP or REST, any TCP IP call, making a call to your database servers. Uh, database servers, in fact, have got two kinds of IO bound workloads. One is the actual call to the database server itself using a TCP IP, which is a network bound. And then the database server itself making uh, calls to the uh, IO subsystem, the, the, the disk uh, subsystem. And so both of those workloads are IO bound. So that's some idea about IO bound workloads. IO or asynchronous IO is more about uh, scalability and throughput, not so much about performance in the small, which means if you were to compare um, two systems, two, two, two methods that were written synchronously and asynchronously that did the same work, then you would find that the synchronous method, method is probably a bit faster in in the small meaning when you call it one off two off three off five off but as you start calling that same method uh, more often many times a second you'll find that the asynchronous method especially when the method itself is doing io workloads not uh, compute bound workloads uh, the asynchronous method will be more performant and therefore will scale and give you more throughput as compared to the synchronous method so asynchronous methods are a powerful productivity tool, enabling you to more easily write scalable and responsive applications. It's important to keep in mind 
though that asynchrony is not a performance optimization, as I said, for the individual or single operations or in the small, uh, taking asynchronous operations and making them asynchronous will invariably degrade the performance of that one operation as it still needs to accomplish everything that the synchronous operation did, but now with additional constraints and considerations. So a reason you care for asynchrony then is performance in the big or performance in the aggregate. That is how your overall system performs when you write everything asynchronously such that you can overlap I.O. and achieve better system utilization, consuming the resources only when they're actually needed. <coughs> so uh, a bit about scalability for those, at least in this, in this context, what I mean by scalable is a, a system whose performance improves after adding hardware proportionally to the capacity added is said to be scalable, meaning for a compute-bound workload, if I've written some, pro some, some, some program, let's say, you know, some statistical uh, analysis that is using the CPUs, then if on my machine, which is, let's say, a four-core machine, it utilizes all four cores, or what we call saturates all cores, and then if I throw it on, say, a Xeon E7, which is a 10-core CPU, and it saturates all 10 cores there, then the system is scalable, meaning it, it is able to utilize all of the hardware as efficiently as possible, rather than leaving you know performance on the table, if you will. So from a CPU-bound workload pers perspective, uh, a system that utilizes all cores or saturates all cores, no matter how many there are, is a highly scalable, or in this case, uh, an embarrassing, embarrassingly parallel system. Conversely, in IO-bound workloads, um, since IO-bound workloads are uh, at the network card level, let's say, at the hardware level, and not at the CPU level, then the, if the IO-bound workload is able to saturate the IO subsystem to the maximum extent possible, then you are not leaving any performance on the table. Therefore, that system can scale. So as you improve the IO subsystem at the hardware level, the overall system that you've written that is able to saturate the IO subsystem is then going to scale, just just to get that out of the way. Um, to a large extent, the a well-written system then improves responsiveness from the end user's perspective, even though it may seem counterintuitive, uh, because, I mean, as, as your system scales or needs to handle more requests per second, if your system is able to scale, then the overall responsiveness of that system does improve. Uh, so again, it's just more about uh, performance in the in the big or performance in the aggregate, aggregate, not in the small. Uh, in this slide, I want to contrast for you the at a very high level the processing asynchronous processing versus uh, synchronous processing. So in the in the top part of the slide, this is the thing here. So then on the top part of the slide uh, is the synchronous version, and in the bottom part we have the asynchronous version. Um, think of this as a as a graph or a timeline. It's not really uh, drawn that way, but time is moving from, from left to right. The dotted line here is the boundary between uh, kernel mode operations and, uh, sorry, kernel mode is down here, operations versus user mode operations. User mode operations are typically all the applications we we write there in user mode, and user mode applications are quite restricted. There's lots of checks and balances in place to make sure we don't step on each other's toes and we don't do things that are typically not allowed by the operating system. Kernel mode drivers, kernel mode processes, they are, these are applications typically device drivers. They run at a much more privileged mode and less res restrictive. As a result, they run a lot faster than user mode applications. All IO starts, or all IO is run done at the kernel mode because it's really working with the, the network cards uh, at, at the IO subsystem level. So typically we're dealing with some device drivers there. So imagine a thread that starts off at some point and is doing some work, and at that point here, it kicks off or starts uh, uh, an I.O. workload, reading a file or making a network call. So while the call is in progress, or the work is in progress, this thread is blocked. It's doing absolutely nothing. And obviously, you can imagine if you want to scale a system, then you can't have threads sitting there doing absolutely nothing because that's the whole point of a thread is to actually get it to do something 
Uh, and if you want to be uh, scaling, then you need to be able to utilize all of your resources to the extent, best extent possible. So just keep that in mind here. So while this thread, uh, not thread, while this IO bound workload is pro being processed, this thread here is blocked. And at some point, the, the network call comes back or the file has finished reading. And it then comes back into user mode. And the thread now starts to process the data that came back from that IO call. So there was a bit of dead time here, which is what I want to kind of keep in mind. Between these two points, the thread was blocked, doing nothing, and was not able to do anything else because it was done synchronously. The, the processing was done synchronously. Uh, in an async scenario, the same thing happens here, but at this point, the thread initiates a IO bound workload, so it, it kicks it off and it runs immediately because you're doing it asynchronously. The, the call returns you know, to your program right away in the next instant and you're able to continue processing whatever you need to process on this thread. Now, <coughs> in a UI scenario, the thread is essentially the, the main thread, the, the, the UI thread, and therefore the UI thread is able to process um, the various messages from the message pump, you know, events and things. So you haven't spawned a new thread. There's no additional threads being spawned, but the work is being done asynchronously. Okay, so keep that in mind. On a server side scenario, this thread, that is here is free to to process other requests so you're not trying to keep the ui free but essentially you're freeing up this thread to process other requests while you are busy doing this this uh, io bound workload here okay so at some point this io bound workload completes and it interrupts the the thread for a split second and says hey i'm done and you can then take that data or whatever the response was from the io workload and process it on the main thread. So the main thread was interrupted for like, you know, microseconds when it initiated the workload and when the workload returned. The thread was free to do other things and not wait around for the IO to complete. Um, in this thread, I'm gonna show you some of the, I guess, underpinnings of IIS and how IIS has been built over the years, some improvements that they've done um, so what we have here again is that there's sort of two parts to this. There's the upper part, which is user mode stuff, and then the lower part, which is kernel mode stuff. Now, those who are interested um, in some history here, the, the original web servers were all obviously in user mode, meaning um, they ran as applications would run normally in, in, in an operating, on an operating system. And so they ran in user mode. They didn't run as device drivers. In IS6, they introduced HTTP sys, which was the kernel mode device driver that did a part, a big chunk of the processing for IIS. Now, this idea of having some of these these functions um, done at the kernel mode device driver level came from, um, I think it was Red Hat Linux. Uh, they, they introduced a web server that essentially did a lot of the, the work in, in kernel mode and the reason is this, that the request is obviously coming to you on in kernel mode, meaning it's coming to you at the hardware level, the network card receives a request in kernel mode, and then it will shoot it up to, so a request comes in, it shoots it up to some web server that you have in user mode. The web server says, oh, okay, well, you want a file, there's a static file, an image or a JavaScript file or a HTML page. Let me go back and get the file for you, where at this point it has to switch back to, uh, to kernel mode to make the call at the IO subsystem level to go receive the file. And then once the file has been received, it comes back to user mode to your web server. The web server says, okay, well, let me go return this as a response to you. Well, they come back to kernel mode to send the response back out. So there's a lot of mode switching between kernel mode and user mode. So kernel mode being down here, user mode being up here, just to receive, to respond to the static file. And in those days, um, I forget what year this was, but in those days, well, this was during IS6's time frame, so whatever that year was, most of the workload was static. Uh, there were not many dynamic websites then. And so it improved the performance probably about 40 to 45%, typically for most websites. In IS7, what they did is they also included the kernel mode caching. And this is, again, if you're gonna have to cache something, you might as well cache it in kernel mode because well, everything that's going to come in and out of here is coming in kernel mode, so why go only to 
to cache something in user mode and come back down to kernel mode to respond with that cached data. So that's how IS is currently implemented in IS 6 and, and now IS 7 as well and 8. Um, our ASP.NET applications are residing here in user mode and this is the WP, W3 WP EXEs are really your application pools. And there's another change made in um, in IS7. Uh, so earlier, in IS5 and 6, when ASP.NET was introduced, we had this ASP.NET ISAPI, which for those of you who've ever programmed at the low-level ISAPI level or ISAPI extensions filters level, understand the ISAPI is the lowest level you can get with, uh, with IS, as in the, the programmability, if you will. And the whole ASP.NET engine was was implemented as an ISAPI, and the name of that ISAPI was ASP.NET ISAPI. What would happen is there are certain event processing that IIS would do, uh, and that event processing happened at the IIS, ISAPI level, and then the, AI, the same event processing was redone at the ASP.NET level. And because of the fact that ASP.NET ISAPI was uh, native, while ASP.NET applications were managed. In IIS 7, they made uh, managed applications first-class citizens of IIS, which essentially meant that the programming you did, if you built any modules or handlers at the managed level, these handlers could participate as first-class citizens in the event processing that would happen once it comes into IIS. So authenticate, uh, authorize, begin and all these kinds of events that you have today now happen only once rather than twice uh, as a result of the fact that these your ASP non applications are first class citizens of, of IIS and all of that has been made possible with the managed engine module as they call it which is a nice happy but it enables our managed applications to become first class citizens of uh, IIS. Um, the other part to keep in mind here is that this IO thread that is coming from IIS is essentially uh, a thread that is on an IO completion port, and we'll get to IO completion ports in the, in the next slide. So, some history again. I'm just going to switch to the next slide, but just talk about some of the history I didn't mention earlier. We've, we've been able to do asynchronous programming in .NET since uh, version 1.1, and the 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 programming style or the pattern was called the APM or the asynchronous programming model, which used uh, begin and pairs of methods. You know, begin get this, end get that, xxx kind of methods. And IIS has always played, <coughs> or has always been capable of doing asynchronous I/O since uh, Windows NT 3.5. So when the ASP.NET ISAPI was built and the ASP.NET pipeline essentially is also made to play nice as I call it, meaning do stuff asynchronously, IO bound asynchronously. The issue really was that we at the ASP.NET application level uh, would build our applications synchronously. So even though the most of the pipeline from the point of getting a request on your network card all the way into your ASP.NET application was capable of processing IO asynchronously and we could write our code asynchronously uh, since .NET 1.1. It was so hard and convoluted that we ended up not using that feature or that capability um, till now. Now in C-Sharp 5, they made it so simple that I think we'd be starting to use asynchronous programming uh, much more as and when needed and thus be better citizens in the uh, whole pipeline. <coughs> so... Here we have a slide where I'm trying to show you the synchronous processing uh, pipeline, if you will. So imagine this request coming into your IS, and the request is then handled by uh, a native IS thread pool thread, and this request then is, is targeted for your ASP.NET application, and so the request heads over to the ASP.NET pipeline, wherein a CRR thread pool thread is kicked off to go make the call into your ASP.NET application. Now, assuming this processing of your application here takes a certain amount of time, while the, your ASP.NET application is processing that request, there is a kind of a connection maintained, if you will, between the originating request, the IS thread pool thread, native thread, and 
this year all thread and this whole chain is tied up till you finish your processing and once you've done your processing then the serial thread pool thread is returned to the serial thread pool this joins up with the native thread returns that request response sorry to the originating request and that request is sent back to the browser or application that made the request in the first place now to contrast that with the asynchronous model um, the asynchronous capability at the IO level is implemented uh, with the technology called IO completion ports. IO completion ports are also known as overlapped IO. Was actually a technique introduced by Windows in uh, Windows NT 3.5 uh, before any other operating system actually had this capability. So uh, it's an incredible technology or capability that was introduced uh, f at, at the Windows level and others have copied it since, you know, AIX, IBM's AIX, and Linux, and uh, Sun, Solaris, all have copied. They don't call it IO completion ports, but the, the technique is copied. And what it allows is to essentially use the IO subsystem uh, much more efficiently. And the new features in, AS, in, in C Sharp 5, the async await, are essentially making it possible for us to, at the managed code level, to very easily play nice, at the I.O. subsystem level using the I.O. completion ports, even though we don't have to know what they are. But I want to kind of give an example here in this slide, the difference between the synchronous versus the asynchronous processing as it pertains to ASP.NET and the IIS pipeline. So request comes into your application and same thing happens. And IIS native thread pool thread picks up the request and hands it off to uh, the CLR thread pool thread in the ASP.NET pipeline, which then makes a call into your ASP.NET application. <coughs> now at this point, things start to change. If you do your processing asynchronously, which means at that point, this thread is returned back to the thread pool thread. And when that thread is returned to the thread pool thread, it is free to process other requests. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now when that happens, the native thread pool thread is also returned to the IS native thread pool. And the originating uh, request here is moved over to an IO completion port waiting. It's, it's like, you know, if, you, if you've seen uh, aircrafts on over Dulles Airport, they're, um, they're circling the airport on, in, on, in a whole pattern, waiting their chance to land. So this thread is now waiting in the IO completion port mode. That So in other words, the, the request the requesting application of the browser, the user sitting on the browser, is not seeing any benefit with regards to, at least in the, in the small, meaning for the one-off request, they're not seeing any benefits to us doing our processing asynchronously at the ASP.NET level. But this this originating request is now uh, tied up over here waiting for the response. Now at some point, you know, some milliseconds later, you've finished your processing in this application and you signal to the Sierra thread pool saying, hey, you know, I'm done, come and get your response. So a thread comes in to pick up your response and go back to the Sierra thread pool, and that makes a call to the thread and some other threads. So both of these threads that just came in are not necessarily the same threads. They're just some other threads that were available at that moment in time. And so this thread has come back to pick up your response, and it goes and ties up with the originating request hands the request over to that originating request, and that request goes back as a response to the calling application or browser, and this thread pool thread is now returned back to the thread pool, awaiting other requests or available to process other requests. So the complexity that you might have seen here between this, this communication here is completely transparent to us at the programming level. We are not dealing with IO completion ports. We have no idea of what's kind of going on behind the scenes. It's very, very simple. Uh, and we don't really have to even know any of this stuff, but I thought it would be interesting to explain or try at least uh, how IO completion ports are implemented and how it works for us behind the scenes at the ASP.NET level. Okay, so now it's time for um, some code. So let's go move on to some um, some code here. So I thought before going into the MVC code, let's take a look at the begin-end 
um, pattern or the APM pattern, the old style .NET 1.1 onwards pattern for asynchronous programming and contrast that with um, the new uh, async await pattern introduced for us in C Sharp 5. Now since 1.1 many other patterns have been introduced. There was the the EAP, the event application programming or asynchronous programming model and then there was the task based asynchronous programming model, the TAP, TAP model. They're all very similar personally. I don't think one is any better than the next. I think they're, they're different alternatives for the same problem. Um, the most performant one I've seen is the begin await, the original one that is introduced in .NET uh, 1.1. In fact, on my website, in my blog, um, I have a comparison between the task based, uh, which was introduced in .NET 4, and the begin await, begin end uh, pattern introduced in .NET 1.1. For those who are interested, there's a link actually in, on the last slide, which you'll probably see in part two, that links to that the article on my blog that does the comparative tests. So here I want to just do a, a simple um, application that downloads some, some HTML uh, from my blog in this case. I don't want to actually explain any the technical aspects of what I'm doing here but I just wanted to, to, to see the code and the complexity. I'll be mumbling to myself um, hopefully trying to explain some things but I, this is not about showing you either the the APM or when I contrast that with the async await uh, style programming. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to actually explain any of that in this round, but when we move into the MVC examples, then I'll start explaining uh, start explaining some of the concepts of behind the async await stuff. So So <clears throat> I'm going to do a begin uh, something, begin get response, and that gives me a callback. And one of the differences here in between .NET 1.1 and um, what I'm doing now is that we have lambdas now, so I'm actually able to use lambdas that in some ways makes things look a little simpler than they actually are, that would have been uh, in .NET 1.1 days where we didn't have lambdas in um, we had these methods, these end methods that kind of just stood by themselves and yet uh, there was no kind of connection between why they were there and what they were doing there. But with the lambdas, because they're self-contained kind of within the same method, it's easier to to see. Uh, there's a typo here. Let me just fix that. Not that it matters, but... Okay, so now that I've done a begin get response, I need to do an end get response. And the end get response takes in the async result here. And that returns to me a web response. And once we have the web response, we need to use the web response to get a response stream. And the get response stream is a stream. So I'll use using. Once we have a stream, we should be able to read from the stream. So read, begin read. So I'm doing this asynchronously. So there's a begin read that requires again another async result that has no state. Okay, so I'm not doing something right here. Oh, sorry, my mistake. This is just a buffer, so I need to declare. Get a buffer. Buffer offset zero. Buffer dot length. And now we get the 
async. Actually, yeah, well, I'm not going to be able to do this in in line because it's going to be a recursive call, and so I need to have this this callback actually declared elsewhere. So let me just do that. Uh, let's call this read callback is equal to uh, lambda. Okay, so once we have this, I'll actually just change this to use that callback. So it'll be read callback. Okay, go back up here. Um, this is a begin read, so I would need to do response uh, response read dot end read, giving it the IR. That gives me uh, bytes read. And once you got the bytes read, you do if bytes read greater than zero, then we can write out the stream to uh, our console. Oops. Uh, get string buffer offset zero. This time will be bytes read. And once we finished reading, uh, this as I said, this was a loop, so we basically need to do this uh, rewrite this part here. So, sorry, this was be after, and we call back. So it doesn't like that. Oh, I uh, understand what this is. Uh, it's the compiler not able to, to kind of do a recursive read here. So just declare it separately and then call it that works. So now there's a problem here. We have to account for, I'm not sure what it is here at this point, but it's basically if the byte set have, is not greater than zero, then it, we are kind of done. But let's run this and see how this works. Oh, this is asynchronous. So I need to also do a console.read line here waiting till we are done and not when it is done. Forbidden. Whoa. Okay, so that's because of my URL here. Okay, so it's not completed. Um, there should be it, it should be ending with an HTML since this is a page, and you can see here that it's uh, causing some trouble. Um, okay, so the reason is <coughs> that at this point we need to wait for that everything to finish. So. Um, as I said, I'm not, I wasn't going to explain this thing to you here, but uh, what's happening is over here I need to wait, and then over here I guess I need to do a um, was it set? Okay, so one basically I'm getting it to wait over here, and when it's finished, I set it at that point. This releases, and then earlier what was happening is this web request was going out of scope and being being disposed by the system. So why, even though we are waiting here, this thing had already finished as soon as it hit the first line. Okay, so this should work now. Okay, so there we are. We know with the end result, everything works fine. Now the equivalent of this in uh, C-sharp 5, I'm just going to copy this over here and okay, so what we would do now is we would let me scroll up a bit we do the HP request dot, so instead of doing this asynchronously, we'll just do a get response, but we'll do a get response async. Now what they've done in .NET 5 is a uh, seizure 5 is that they've gone back and they've added these methods that return or end with the async key, uh, word for every wherever possible wherever there was some IO being done and wherever we had a begin and end uh, method pairs the old style APM we now also have the sort of the async or the awaitable methods there so once we get a get response async uh, what we get back is a uh, 
is a web response like we were doing before getting before and this needs to be awaitable so if you look at this basically i will i'm over here at this point so i've just done this call but instead of doing it asynchronously i'm doing it synchronously and um this needs to have the async modifier with a task return okay so once we've done that web response we have this using right so we still have the same line here using okay and once we are in this response stream we do the the read so the begin read but so we'll do a read async and that gives us uh, using the buffer so let me just copy this stuff from here so once we have the buffer offset zero buffer dot length that was convenient. That returns to us um, the bytes read. So bytes read, and await this as well. And once we have the bytes read, well, actually, you know, because again, this is going to be recursive. So zero, and here we do um, while. Oops, I don't want to do that. while bytes red blah 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 is greater than zero and what do we do so then we basically write to the console which is that and this is going to loop till it's done so let us also name this to async so what will happen now is if i do this async i guess let's run it and it completed yeah, as uh, so what do you, what i wanted to see here is that if you were to compare this methods implementation the old style begin uh begin and method pairs of the apm model the task based model is not any simpler it's a bit simpler in my mind it's uh, not any a whole lot simpler but the new async await pattern is vastly simpler in fact this is exactly how you would write the synchronous version of this code there would be no change in the sequence of steps that you would do for the synchronous uh, method uh, synchronous style writing this code the only difference that you're seeing is that you got an await in in, the, uh, in, in some of the methods here and your um, method has been decorated with the async modifier and it returns a task instead so anyway that's what i want to show you so hopefully this shows you the the ease of with which you can now in c sharp 5 write asynchronous uh, programming or, or asynchronous methods as compared to the old style begin and uh, apm okay so now let's move on to the mvc demos mvc4 <coughs> demos what we're going to do in this uh, um, the code from here on in is to we'll be working on an asp.net mvc application and <coughs> this application is going to be downloading some data from a remote service uh, in this case the service i put up a service on on azure the service contains some data about members and their videos or or their movies and we will be accessing this data from our mvc application so just take let's take a look at the uh, data itself Azure websites .net slash API slash uh, member videos slash one. So this might take a few seconds to start up. Okay, so there it is. We have. Um, let me show. Okay, there it is. So it's, it's just JSON data about uh, different movies. Different members have different movie um, favorites or choices. We have three members. Each member has a different set of movies that they like and so we're going to be using this data to uh, in our uh, presentation so in our MVC application I'm going to create a, a new controller let's call this control home controller and let's uh, make this a controller 
let's add a action to that. Let's call this action. No, actually, let's call this action sync. So the first action is going to be downloading data synchronously, and then after that, we'll create other actions. So let's have a method here that says download data given a string, uh, the URL. It'll download this data. Now, the class I'm going to be using here is a class that we have uh, available in .NET 4.0. It's actually a, a class that does asynchronous uh, calls, but we are going to be using it synchronously in this demo, in this method here. So the way it becomes uh, asynchronous is by using a blocking call. So even though the method here is asynchronous, I'm going to be using the blocking call, which is the result. So you can see that this <coughs> this result is returning to us uh, an HTTP response message when it's blocked. So let's assign that. And once we have an HTTP response message, we just want to ensure that it's uh, got the proper status code or 200 status code. And once we've done that, we can extract the content and read the content. Again, even though the method is synchronous, it says async. We're actually going to be doing this um, as a blocking call. I'm going to get this to return an enumerable of video. Uh, we don't have video yet. Let me go define that as well. Result. Okay, so in our models, we should define a new type called video, which looks something like, um, like this. It's got a bunch of properties, simple properties. One is the title. The next is um, uh, the category. And the last one is the image URL. Okay, now that we have that. Moving on here, this download data should be returning an enumerable of video. Video. Add the namespace. Okay. So once you've got this data, we just return this. So this is a synchronous way of using this class, but uh, as I said, the class is capable of doing things asynchronously. But for now, for the demo purposes, we're doing this synchronously. So now once we have this data, oh, sorry, there's another piece we need to do here. Let's call this uh, another method that returns an enumerable of video. That's called get videos. And this video, this method is the one that actually makes the calls to the download data. Sources. We don't. Have, we haven't defined sources. I've got a copy of the thing here. These are the different URLs that we're going to use in our in our demo here. So I'm just defining. It. So it's an array of string that has uh, different URLs for each of the the members. So as I said earlier, we are going to be calling these methods one by one, as if there were three separate service calls from the Azure service here. So we have sources now. Okay. And once we have the sources, we can do the download data passing in the single URL. This returns to us an enumerable. So so actually what we're going to have here, since every call is returning an enumerable of video, it's going to be accumulated into a list of enumerable of video, which essentially means this method is going to return a Innumerable or enumerable of video. So let's define a all videos list. That is a list of enumerable of videos. And then in here dot add. And then we return that collection. So that takes care of downloading the videos, which in turn calls the synchronous uh, is uh, the synchronous I/O method that downloads the actual data, 
converts that data into C sharp classes, returns to us an enumerable of video. And then in our page here, in, sorry, in our action, let's call get videos. Okay, so now we need a view. Since we don't have a view, let's go create the view. So in our um, views, we need a, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I actually want to put that into another folder. Let's call that home. And now in the home, um, we add a view. Let's call this index. We'll be reusing this view from multiple actions. I'm just going to call it index. Now, the HTML is right here. Rather than you watching me type, just copy paste it. So I think that will work. The other thing to notice here is that the images are also coming from a remote service and we're using this image URL property of the, the video class we defined earlier to determine which video to show in here. So um, a table is being created and for every member, there's a separate row and that, that way each row represents a member's videos and we'll have in this case three rows because we have three members. So that takes care of the view. The view is done. And here we can view slash home slash index dot html. That's the view passing it the data. So we have a synchronous call. Let's also alter the default page of the, the website to return to us uh, or call the the home slash sync action and let's close that so if we run this hopefully we should see some data in our or some images in our browser remember each row represents a single member and as i said earlier the each member has their own preferences for the kinds of movies that they like the first one likes the the star wars movies as we shall hopefully see here in a second there is so the first one likes the star wars movie that's the first row the second row likes uh, science fiction movies so we've got various terminator uh, and transformers etc and the last one likes uh, drama movies so we haven't included some timing here so let's go add some timing to our um, action oops uh, we only want to time the amount of time it takes to get the the data itself so we're not going to time the the rendering itself, but just the, uh, the amount of time it takes for the data to be downloaded. Um, so stop. And then we can do uh, view bag dot elapsed is equal to stopwatch dot elapsed milliseconds. Let me scroll this up a bit. Okay. So, and then once we have this um, view bagged or elapsed, um, let's go also add this into our view. We can leave the H2 in there. I think I should do it. Okay, let's run this and hopefully we shall see the amount of time it takes to download the data synchronously three times in this page so the the amount of time it takes for the images to actually appear on the browser is not part of the timing it's just the actual data scroll down here you can see at the bottom um, it took about 1.88 seconds which is about yeah 1.8 seconds i'm going to refresh let's see how much time it takes this time it takes about 1.4 so about one and a half seconds for three calls that's about averaging about half a second per call equals one and a half seconds in all right because we're done doing this synchronously so now there's another way to do this makes maybe speed it up a little bit and that is to make these calls in parallel that is spawn threads to make uh, instead of making three calls one after the other we could be making these three calls in parallel using threads so let's try that scenario so in order to do that we'll just change this method here the get video videos method uh, make, let's make it get videos parallel parallel 
and let's change this to par parallel the parallel uh, capability was introduced in dotnet 4 as part of the the task parallel library so it has various uh, along with uh, p link or parallel link so we'll use our sources as the source it needs uh, an action that passes in the url and that takes care of that so that converted the pretty simple to convert stuff from serial or single thread to multi-threaded with the parallel dot four and parallel dot four each capabilities so now with that we have this uh, in parallel now what's going to happen here is that these uh, there's no guarantee as to the sequence in which each member's data is going to be downloaded so we might and we probably will see that the sequence of star wars and science science fiction and drama is not going to remain the same it, it could come in any other order now that's not to say that you can't do that when you use parallel dot for each but in this demo that's not the, the point or intent so it's as design let's define a okay so the other thing just to keep in mind is we are still downloading the io so the io is still being done synchronously we're just making the calls in parallel okay let's add a new action that is a copy of this action let's call this sync p and the implementation over here calls get videos parallel and does it just pretty much the same thing okay now let's run this and we should see here so the sync version we know is going to take about one and a half seconds that's kind of as would be expected it probably looks like it's taking some long okay so it's about one and a half seconds but if you refresh it it'll be about one and a half seconds so that's about 1.4 seconds okay now let's change this to sync p and what you're going to notice here is that it's taken about one third of that time so it's taken about 500 milliseconds one third of the time which was in some ways expected right you had your if, if three calls being done synchronously takes one and a half seconds then one call should take oh sorry three calls in parallel should be the amount of time it takes for the one longest call and so it takes about 500 milliseconds but you notice here that it's the sequence every time i hit refresh on the browser the sequence in which the data is arriving is not necessarily controlled right so i'm you're seeing it's in different which is fine which is what we were expecting so this is telling you that doing things in parallel in asp.net by spawning threads is speeding things up but let me tell you this is not necessarily um, how things are going to behave in production and we're going to now test some of the scalability capabilities between the synchronous and the parallel version not we're not so far done any async versions even though this whole talk is about asynchronous but i want to just show you that the performance in the small meaning making one and two calls is not necessarily uh, telling of how the system is going to behave at scale now the poor man's way of doing this uh, might sound a little weird to some of you but the poor man's way of doing this is basically just hit the f5 key on the browser and have rapid fire requests being pushed onto the server and see how it behaves and if it ever comes back so right now we have this i'm going to change this to the sync p version and it uh, if you just notice the the wheel on the tab here you'll see the the wheel turning i'm going to hit the f5 button pressed and i'm going to keep it pressed so it's going to be making rapid fire succession calls uh, requests to the to the application using the synchronous action okay and here it goes one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and i've left the the key f5 key so it's no longer making calls this browser will eventually return if you look at notice the the timing wheel on the tab that says local host there you'll see that the the browser is still working and at some point the browser is going to return um when the server is finally finished processing all of those requests you'll see the last one return here in the browser any minute now or any second now and let's just wait because it does take a while when you're making rapid fire successions uh, requests in succession and well uh, okay so there it is it's come back the actual timing per call is not important here we know it's going to take a lot longer if it's getting too many requests simultaneously but it did return 
Okay, so again, this is the poor man's way of doing it. It's not necessarily the, the way I recommend you do the things in, in production or to verify the performance or scale of your applications in production. Okay, so now we're calling the sync P version. I've called it once, the page is refreshed. Now let me keep my F5 key press for 10 seconds and see what happens. Again, notice the, the icon here next to the word index, which is currently the IE icon. It'll eventually change to a spinning ball of death as they call it. And let's see if it returns. So here it goes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I've left the key. And let's see if this browser comes back. Of course, the the synchronous version took a bit, quite a bit of time, uh, much more time than I actually expected. Let's see if we can wait for that long and see if something comes back. One would think that this would come back uh, sooner since it has been showing us that it comes back in one third the time. But what you're going to notice here, and if we waited endlessly, you'd notice that or you'd see that this request or this browser is never coming back. What's really happened is it has brought IS 7 Express to its knees because of the fact that it's spawning threads. So for every rapid fire request that was made on the browser, uh, from the browser, the server side has had to spawn three threads per request. That's a lot of threads. And eventually, IS 7 Express, which is not obviously made to uh, be a production quality server, has, has been brought to its knees. Um, besides that, even on IS 7, the production version, or IS 8 in the new Windows uh, uh, 8, the server, you're still taxing the server when you spawn threads in, IS, in ASP.NET. So the key thing to remember here is even though the parallel version might give you performance in the small, it is going to kill your capability to scale or performance in the big. Okay, so as you can see, this browser is not coming back. Now, the only way to recover from this is I found is to kill IS8, sorry, IS7 in this case, Express. So I'm going to stop the site. I'm going to then exit this. I'm also going to shut down the VS because sometimes even that uh, needs to be done and restart Visual Studio. Hopefully that will fix it. Uh, let me go back to this application we just created here. And if it runs, then I'll show you the a little better way of, remember in part two of this, or the next version, next, next video, we're going to be looking at better tools that allow us to test the scalability of applications in a more, more thorough, uh, predictable manner. Okay, so this comes back. Now let's use uh, another tool uh, called Active, uh, sorry, it's called Apache Benchmark. Apache Benchmark is a free tool uh, available from the... Uh, uh, from the Apache folks, Apache project. And it, it is essentially a tool that makes requests on a specific URL and you can control the number of requests and the number of concurrent requests you can make. So here it goes. So the number of requests I want to make currently is one. The number of concurrent requests I want to make is one. And I want to make it to this URL, which is this one, the sync version. Okay. So that's the URL. So one request in con with one current con request to this URL that you're seeing here, the, the, the sync version. Behavior should not be any different. We're going to see that it took about 1.6 seconds. Run it again. Um, it takes about... So in case you're not seeing what I'm seeing here or what I'm looking at, this is the, the portion I'm looking at. So that's 1.5 seconds. Okay. So... So now let's look at the sync P version. One request made concurrently on the sync P version. And you're seeing here that it's about one third the time, which is 500 milliseconds, okay? So I won't be zooming in anymore so you can kind of see it happening like that. Just watch that area there. Okay, how about if we made to the synchronous version, we made 10 calls, 10 concurrently, right? So 10 concurrent requests to the synchronous version. So it normally would take 1.5 seconds. It now takes about 4.9 seconds, which is not obviously 10 times the amount of time, which is great. So it's less than 10 times, about uh, three times as much, almost. And so for the concurrent, 10 concurrent requests synchronously, that's what it takes 
about one point uh, four and a half seconds about almost five seconds let's do that synchronous uh, pa in parallel so let's do the sync p version which is remember for every request is spawning three threads and these requests are coming in concurrently so it's going to be three requests uh, three threads per request and it's going to happen pretty fast as in the the server and ASP.NET have to spawn quite a few threads here goes so surprisingly for most people um, this is going to return in about 15 seconds or so rather than the five seconds that we've seen uh, the other one did so what's going on here so it's about 12 and a half seconds is that um, because of the number of threads being spawned it has taken us a long time so that first time we've taken a hit and that's fine that's great so well we'll only get a hit for the first time how about we fire the request once again so the same call again I'm going to fire it this time it's going to turn faster because the threads have already been spawned and they've been cached by both the IASP.NET uh, thread pool or CR thread pool and the native threads by IIS as well so it's now taking about a second which is great it looks like it's pretty good it scales right it took three times the time for this for the sync p version to come back just like it took three times the time for the parallel version to come back except the sync p version is coming coming back in one second um, it, it used to come back in uh, half a second now it's in one second okay is that true for all scalabilities how about we fire 50 threads 50 concurrently on the sync p sync version so let's look at the sync version first 50 threads 50 threads concurrently 50 requests 50 requests concurrently so this is the synchronous version so it's queuing it up the the threads are being queued up in IIS and each request is taking a certain amount of time so threads are being backed up and eventually all the requests will be satisfied it's taking a much longer than I would expect well that is un totally unusual I have never seen that <laughs> happen ever before in all of my demos and use so let's assume that it's just uh, normally I don't do that poor man's call where you know it just blows out that brings IS to his knees so I think that's probably what the problem is here okay let's try it again if it doesn't I'm just gonna reset my system and come back so again the synchronous call 50 calls concurrently synchronously one after the other so it's kind of it, for every call it's going to wait for or they're going to be in parallel but the ones that are in parallel will be done synchronously mm, doesn't look like it's coming back so well there it comes back so it took about 19 seconds that's not normal but maybe because of some network uh, issues it's taking time it's going to fire one more time it's normally about four seconds so four and a half seconds so almost five seconds let me see if that makes any better here so 50 calls synchronously, 50 calls in, in sorry, synchronously in, in concurrent. I'm sorry, it's just so confusing to say this over and over. Okay, 19 seconds. Let's see what happens to the sync P version of this. So <laughs> for those of you who are pretty an already anticipating this, the sync P version, 50 requests concurrently is not going to come back. Now different platforms have different behavior I notice on my Windows 8 machine things behave slightly differently I think they've made some changes in the performance metrics of IS 7.8 or IS 8 on Windows 8 only not on Windows 7 where sometimes it does come back uh, sometimes it most times it doesn't so but in you can see here it's now timed out it's just not coming back so that's one key takeaway even though the parallel version seemed to p give you performance in the small one-off calls uh, and in, in scale it does not scale so if you're thinking of using parallel uh, making parallel calls parallel IO calls uh, in your applications for the small it's okay if you don't see these calls being made in rapid succession or too often they won't be the bottleneck but as you try and scale those would be will be the bottleneck now let's look at the synchronous version of the same thing so I'm going to look at uh, take this download data method and copy it and the reason I'm copying it is because the synchronous asynchronous version is pretty much the same so some things one is the method itself should be called async 
as per convention. So that's the convention, the naming convention they've come up with is make your end your method names with the word async at the end of it. All of these blocking calls we're going to remove. So when it was being blocked, what was being returned here is a HTTP response message. Now let's remove the the blocking call. Remember, don't ever try and mix blocking with asynchronous. It's just not going to work. there will be unpredictable behavior. Now that we removed the dot result, which was the blocking call, what is this variable? It's no longer a HTTP response message. It is a task of, as you can see here, a task of T result, where T result is the HTTP response message. So it's now become a task of HTTP response message. But you probably didn't notice it before. I didn't actually highlight it before. Is this the awaitable? So this method is, is awaitable, okay? And so what we can do is let's await it. Okay, but when you do that, it says over here, uh, let me scroll this a bit, there, okay. So it says the await operator can only be used within an async method. Consider marking this method with the async modifier. Okay, let's consider that. So we go up here and mark it as async. We do that, we get another error that says um, the return type of this async method must be a void task or task of t. Now, even though the void is allowed as a return type for async methods, I personally say if you have nothing to be returned, return a task instead. The void, I think returning uh, option is only for, I believe, for supporting events in .NET to make events asynchronous. So for the method that you write, make sure this either a task or task of t. So in this case, whatever your method was returning, the synchronous version was returning, is now going to return a task of that, the task of t. <coughs> Once you've done that, everything seems to work and this await now suddenly became a keyword, meaning it's turned blue in this case and that's why it's called an, a contextual keyword that is in the context of it being used in an async uh, a method mo modify, marked with the async modifier the await is a keyword, okay? So that's all we have to change. One knows the naming convention, which is async. Uh, apply the async modifier to the method. Make the method return a task of T or just a task. And then use the await uh, contextual keyword at least once in this, in this method. Now there's another blocking call here. Let's remove that. So well, before I do that, let me show you what it is returning. So if I looked at here, it's returning a task of ionable of video, but the result in this case, when you say dot result, as when you make a blocking call, it unwraps the task. So if we remove the result, the task is back in place. And what we need to do here is we need to, now to unwrap it, we need to await this like we did before. So all that's really happened is the result has been removed the blocking call has been removed and we've added the await keyword at the end of, uh, at the beginning of these calls. Now there will be some confusion here for those who've been watching this keenly. You'd notice that we are returning a task of ionable of video. Let me assign this to a variable here. What is this variable now? This variable is an ionable of some t where t is a, a video, right? So in other words, this variable r is an ionable of video, right? Because we unwrapped the task. So the await unwraps the task. In this case, this method is returning a task of ionable of video, but when you use the await keyword, it unwraps the task. So this variable here is nothing but a ionable of video not a task of ionable of video yet when we return it the compiler seems to be okay with it it's not complaining what if we was to do this which is now returning a task of ionable video at this point you get a message that says uh, it's going to be a little long to to show here but that's what it is so it says since this is an async method the return expression must be of type ionable of video rather than a task of ionable of video. Even though I said all async methods must return a task of t, the compiler at this point is saying it needs to be just an ionable 
of the not uh, task of I need more videos. So there's a confusion there, but I think you get past this confusion once you start to work with it because you kind of realize that the task of T is just a, I'm not even sure what to say because <laughs> you kind of just want to ignore it. You're really working with the iNewable video and that's all you care about. So this method should be returning an iNewable of video, which is why you want to put an await in there, which unwraps the task and you're left with the iNewable of video and that's what you're returning, even though the signature of the method says it's, it's returning a task of iNewable of video. The other thing to um, I want to show you here while, while we're at it is how this thing is actually working. The compiler essentially breaks down this, this method into multiple steps here. Every time it sees an await, it takes the rest of this method, all of it, the rest of it, and puts it into a callback. And this, the call from here returns immediately. So as soon as the execution reaches this point, it returns from this method. And then it kind of calls it back, the rest of the method, um, when this part is done. So it's kind of like the begin end where, you know, the, the begin was a, uh, the end came into a callback. So you're not writing the code like that, but that's what the compiler is really doing is breaking up <coughs> this method into two parts. This is the first part. And then this is the second part. And then there's another wait here. So it basically breaks everything else that's after this method into a third part. So without trying to confuse you, but that's really what's happening. Uh, behind the scenes, the compiler produces a state machine or code, and we'll see in the slides in the the next part, I'll show you briefly the kind of code it generates for very simple asynchronous methods to be able to allow you to program or think synchronously even though you're writing asynchronous code. Okay, moving on. We need to define a download, uh, sorry, a get videos async method. So I'm going to copy this. Let's call this get videos async. That calls download data async instead of download data, right? And at this point, there's a problem here because guess what? You already know this, right? Um, the list is a enumerable of enumerable video, but we are what we're getting back as a task of, right? Because we don't we've not used the await keyword here. Once we put the await. Do um, you get another error saying this await needs to be in an async uh, or a method modifier with the async modifier? So let's go make put that in. Yes, and you guessed it. We need to then add the task keyword to that. So it's returning a task of whatever that is. So notice I'm not concerned with whatever it is. I'm not going to read that the the return types. I just know whatever it is. I need to make it a task of whatever it is, and that fixes that. So now we have a get videos async method. Also notice that these methods are now kind of crawling up, and I'll explain what that what I mean by that. We need a synchronous, uh, an async version of this action. So let's define that async, and it calls get videos async. But this data type here is, yep, you guess it. It's actually a task of something, and the something happens to be uh, an enumerable of enumerable of videos. And the the view does not obviously know how to work with the task of enumerable of enumerable of videos, so we need to await that to unwrap the task. But when we do that, it says this action needs to be marked with the async modifier. And the moment we we do that, this needs to be a task of action result. So the, the neat thing about this whole thing is that in C Sharp 5, they have gone ahead and made all of these methods that were originally synchronous, right up to, in this case, an action that can be marked with the async modifier to make this whole thing asynchronous. And what I was saying earlier was from start to end, this method calls another asynchronous method, calls another asynchronous method, which is here. And it's this method that does the actual async. So the async IO is most of the time at the tail end of your calls, yet the whole chain of calls from the entry point, in this case your controller, right to the point that makes the call. So if you're using a database call asynchronously, then right from your controller through to your business layer, through to your data layer, and actually making the call to the data access, uh, to, to the database, all of those calls need to be marked with the async modifier. All of those calls are asynchronous, except 
it's only the last call, the tail end of it, that's actually doing the asynchronous work. From the calls from start to end, from point of entry to the end and back, all need to be asynchronous. So now we have a synchronous method here, or synchronous action, sorry. Asynchronous action, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, uh, that is marked with async modifier that uses the await here, that unwraps that, that task, and now makes it a ienewable of something, which is nothing but an ienewable of ienewable of video, which is what we expect, or which is what the, the view expects. And everything should be just as we expect here. So let's run this. Now there are besides the the issue I talked about earlier, not issue, but the sort of confusion of you know the method seems to be returning one thing, or the signature says it returns one thing, but you're returning another thing. There is another gotcha that you have to be careful about. We'll look at that right away. So the sync method here returns in well, it's not normal, but so let's refresh it. Should return in about one and a half seconds. So that's about one and a half seconds. Let's change this call now to call the async version and it returns in one and a half seconds refresh it and it returns in one and a half seconds so seems like nothing is different and remember you know async is not about performance in the small it's about performance in the in the aggregate or performance in the big but there is something there is some performance we have left on the table here in this implementation let's take a look at that because it's a it's, a, it's something you're going to do and not necessarily recognize right off right off the bat and that problem relies or it resides in this method here. What we're doing in this method is we are making these calls. The call itself, the IO is asynchronous, but the calls are synchronous, if you will. As in, we are waiting for every call to return before we make the next call. So we can make these calls in parallel. There's no threads involved. We're not spawning threads, but there's no threads involved at all. The calls are being done, they are asynchronous I.O. being done in parallel. Okay, I hope that, that kind of makes sense. So no threads involved, we're just gonna make these calls in parallel or simultaneously, but they're gonna be done asynchronously. The I.O. itself is being done asynchronously. So this method here. So if we didn't await it, <coughs> if we didn't await it, what we're getting back, um, getting back here is some <coughs> task of i new world of video so we need to figure out how to work with the task of i new world video in other words if the task was spawned as in the, the, the the task was started i didn't want to use the word spawn because that relates mainly to threads if the task was started and we could just wait till all tasks are done all tasks will be done in parallel or simultaneously no threads involved and we will return faster, almost like the parallel version that we did earlier, but we are doing this using async IO being done uh, simultaneously, okay? So this list now needs to be a, a, a list of task of, I know this gets confusing, but just bear with, bear with me here. And they have, they introduced with the, with the TPL task file library in .NET 4, and they've added to that in .NET 5, what they call task combinators, which is allowing us to combine tasks in certain ways. So we have over here a task dot, uh, well, the, the wait all is not something you want to use because the wait all is a blocking call. In our case, we want to use the when all. So when all tasks are done, right? Let me know what kind of thing. So it's not blocking, it's, it, they are asynchronous. So when all, and the when all expects uh, let me use the, it's this overload, oops. So this is the overload, Ooh, sorry. It's the, the one that expects uh, an ienewable of tasks in as its parameters, which we already have. The all videos is nothing but an ienewable of tasks because lists are ienewables. What does this do? This returns to us, first of all, you know, it's awaitable, right? And it turns to ask a task of ienewable of video array, but that's nothing but an, an ienewable of ienewable of videos, right? So it's kind of what we were doing before, but it's, it's a task of that. So if you can imagine, if we await that, the task gets unwrapped. And so let's call this guy all video tasks. 
and let's call this guy here all videos and this is all videos so essentially we've gone back to what we had before we just first accumulated the tasks in in a list and then we I don't want to say waited we awaited all the tasks and when they, when they were done we got all of those videos out so this has now been changed to a call that's doing async IO multiple async calls simultaneously in parallel without any threads involved nothing else needs to be changed here let's look at the the time it takes to make the one call so the, the earlier it was one and a half seconds the same as for the synchronous version let's see what it does for the the new and improved async version so still this is still the synchronous call to about one and a half seconds but we know that takes about one uh, sorry it's showing 1.7 but we know it takes about one and a half so now i'm going to change this to the async version and we'll see that it's markedly improved you can see just from the response of the browser it's taking about a third so now we do get performance in the small but that's not necessarily always going to be the case so just keep that in mind if you ever find a synchronous version taking longer than the sorry the asynchronous version taking longer than the synchronous version then that's not an issue to be concerned about right off the bat keep in mind that the asynchronous method implementations provided by the dotnet framework using the async await uh, are well optimized and often end up providing as good or better performance than the well-written asynchronous implementations using the existing patterns such as the begin end um, that we saw earlier but that doesn't necessarily mean that they give you the performance in the small but in this case we are seeing it's, it's almost like the parallel version of let's use apache benchmark and check it out again so i'm just going to go start straight off shoot off to the the async so let's look at the sync p we know the sync version for 50 50 right here if you can see my i can't scroll down so let me just zoom in right so 50 calls 50 calls concurrently for the sync version let's see how much time that takes just to kind of refresh our memory here and that takes um, about four and a half seconds so the sync version is taking 50 calls 50 calls concurrently takes about four and a half seconds let's make this async okay and you see that the async version comes back in three three and a half seconds but actually it should come back much sooner well it's taking about three seconds so now let's do the hundred hundred here 100 calls, 100 calls concurrently, async. Okay, so I'm not trying the sync version, that'll take a while, let's just do the async version. So 50, 50 came back in about three seconds. Let's do the async versions. And that also comes back in approximately, well, it takes about five seconds, but that's 100 calls, double the time is not taking double, double the calls concurrently is not taking double the time. So you can see how beautifully this is coming in about five seconds. The async version is able to scale, <coughs> from a complexity standpoint in the way you write code and also in the way you would debug this code it's not any more complex than the synchronous version yet you do have to remember or learn a few new things uh, and for a few nuances you have to kind of get past or get uh, get over but for the most part uh, the asynchronous version is not slowing things down in fact it's giving you the scalability and responsiveness that you're expecting yet the complexity of the code which i think is the the biggest part about async await in C sharp is so let's look at the code we wrote earlier the begin end um, asynchronous programming model or the APM as we we call as people call it um, to get a sense of what I'm trying to say here now in the next uh, next part so this method the the old style APM or the, the one that uses the, the begin end, I call this uh, kind of code the write once and read never kind of code because it's, even though I just wrote it, uh, you know, half an hour ago, it's not something that that I can recognize right away. I can't understand, I can't wrap my head around what it is that this thing probably is doing without parsing every line of code and going through it step by step to get a sense of what it is that was being done here compare that with the um, the 
asynchronous method here even though it's written as if i've written this code synchronously it is actually asynchronous and that's the the, the one big part about the new feature we have in c sharp 5 is that asynchronous code is now maintainable and readable because it reads like synchronous code the other really cool aspect of this uh, feature is the the debugging experience so i'm going to put a breakpoint in here and i'm going to run this code so you get get a sense of what i'm saying now when i run this code uh, and step through it 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 behaves like it was synchronous even though there's quite a bit of magic going on behind the scenes <coughs> now so if i need to step on i can't use my keyboard shortcuts so i'm um i'm a little lost here but let me i think that's the step so when i step oops that's not sorry so step is f10 okay so when i step in this code now when you hit the await keyword here essentially because that method is asynchronous the the execution actually leaves this method and it's only when the get response async returns does the execution come back into this method it's kind of like the iterators if you've ever played with iterators and written your own uh, methods that return enumerables using the yield return keywords you'll see it kind of behaves almost exactly the same same way in fact some of the genesis or the inspiration for the new async await um, implementation came from the earlier iterator pattern the iterator implementation in fact it was Je jeffrey richter that who came up with um what the heck is that? <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that. Who came up with the idea of using the the iterators for asynchronous programming? Of course, then since then the C sharp team has gone ahead and made quite a few improvements and and modifications to that original concept because they have the option to rewrite the compiler. But so I'm going to step in through this. But imagine that this method execution leaves this method and then comes back when this method has completed asynchronously. So step over and it comes back in here as if it just stepped right through into the next method. Even though behind the scenes this has called, has left this method's execution and then has come back in um, as a part of the continuation, if you will, uh, that the compiler has rewritten this, the remainder of this portion as a continuation to this method. So it's really broken this method up into two separate methods if you will but it looks to us as if it was synchronous step in here whoops can't use the keyboard um step in here and again we hit this other await method here reading the the data asynchronously but it reads as if it's synchronous so this is the really cool part here where um the debugging experience they paid a lot of attention to the debugging experience making it look as if we were debugging synchronous code even though it is asynchronous so that brings us to the conclusion of this part and uh, we will look at in the next part we will look at more on the performance scalability aspects as well as uh, how to how to use some of the features in vs to load or stress test your asp.net applications to essentially ensure that you are getting the scale when you use the asynchronous methods uh, rather than just hoping or guessing that you are getting or going to get this, the scale and responsiveness you are expecting to get. We'll also be looking at areas where or scenarios in which you should or should not be using asynchronous and where you may or may not benefit from using asynchronous. Or maybe there are other alternatives to using the, the new async await that we already have but we've not been looking at. So I'll see you uh, in the next uh, part.